2020 Yo soy Nori, yo you to set new goals and forget all about them after January. One day you get told you'll get a week off from school and you of course celebrate and joke about it with your friends. Who could have expected things to turn out the way they did? September 28 is the day the game released and after half a year people grew tired of their new lifestyle. Personally I wasn't interested enough to download it, however videos kept popping up on Facebook and YouTube for me and eventually my friends learned about it too. Conversations arose while playing other games and we all decided to download it and give it a try. It's done! Oh no it isn't, you still need to download more stuff from within the app itself. Fine, let's do it. With no PC nor PlayStation, I downloaded the game on my phone and that night I booted it up for the first time ever. It was truly one of a kind experience. A beautiful world, visually traffic characters, enchanting music, fun combat, and a story to be heard. A game released at the perfect time, one that offered the entertainment people were thriving for. A game that has proven good and evil, happiness and sadness, love and hate. A piece of art worthy of praise and disappointment. Today I'll tell you all about set piece and my personal opinions of it. Grab a drink and sit, and for the mentally ill, whenever your heart rate starts increasing because my opinion isn't the same as yours, please pause the video, breathe, and then come back. This is Genshin Impact, an expression of mediocrity and lingering hope. I would love to one day be able to make money with this, so please like and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. I will be making more videos like this, and I also stream here on YouTube. So turn on notification if that interests you in any way. Moving on. The opening screen of the game gives you a warm welcome into this new world you're about to enter. With its opening scene where the twins face the unknown god and lose, you get to see what could be the ultimate opposing force in this universe. Then you choose your MC and finally go into the game. At first you don't see much, but then you continue onwards, Paimon the Annoying annoys you for the first time ever, and eventually you get to see a fanboy with his dragon pet. You want to fuck him. The fanboy, not the dragon. I hope. Afterwards you meet Amber, the city of Mondstadt, and other lovely characters. Finally, after the introduction and tutorial, you are finally dropped into the world of the Bat, and the beast that is Genshin Impact embraces you. First, let's all get on the same page and agree that the game couldn't have been as successful as it was without the lockdown. Not only did people have more time, but they were also bored, depressed and unfulfilled. And with so many content creators covering the game, even more people heard of it and decided to give it a try. Like creators to people under the age of 18, people just couldn't resist the temptation. People always have expectations for things, and Genshin had the makings of a great not just game, but piece of art. But remember, even the highest expression of beauty is ugly if it's without essence. From the very beginning of the game, you can notice how lacking it is in its story. I personally value stories in games like this more than anything, since in my eyes, a world and characters without background are just boring and bad. Archon quests are the main story of Genshin Impact, and the prologue for them is without a doubt the worst of all. It could be summarized in The Valin Bad, Venti wants to help him, Abyss Order wants the Valin, Go get the MacGuffin, Fight the Valin, the Valin good! <laughs> and for whatever reason, the one who seems to be controlling the Valin is an Abyss Mage, which is pretty boring. Now, I believe Genshin had the good old lack of vision problem in writing. Today we have the Fatui Harbingers as a main antagonistic force, so Hoivers can use them as enemies and whatnot. However, back then there was no such thing, and because of that their writing was at its worst. The prologue for the game's story has a simple objective, basically no antagonist, no strong motivations for the MC, no real character development, no stakes, no personal implications, no nothing to be honest. And like I said already, I believe this comes from a lack of vision. In order to write the beginning of a story, you need to know how it's going to end. Of course, this can change during the writing process, but you still need a general idea. At the end of the prologue, we see La Signora still Venti's noses, so why couldn't she have been the one behind controlling the Valin? Imagine, no abyss mage. This time La Signora controls the Valin, her plan being that Venti will try to save him since she knows they are friends. At the end of the chapter, we fight the Valin. We manage to win and save him, but we are all exhausted. Out of nowhere, La Signora appears. She didn't count on our being there to help, and she says how she was counting on Venti dying. But that will be enough. She approaches Venti and steals his noses. That's just an idea, so it lacks all of the juice that would go in the middle, but it gives better stuff to work with than what they used. If this was a one-time occurrence, it'd be okay, but it's not. Dragon Spine and Chapter 1, Liyue, are very similar and just as empty and bad structure as the prologue. Chapter 1 sets Liyue as our next stop, Rex Lapis, Zhang Li, and more. I'd say they had a lot of good stuff to work with in this chapter, unlike the prologue, yet they couldn't properly use 99% of it. The introduction is pretty good, people celebrating their god, and suddenly that very god falls from the sky onto its believer's feet. 
Props to you, Hoyoverse, for coming up with such a good opening to the second chapter of Genshin's story. The story continues once again, lacking most of what makes a good story good. There's filler, wasted characters, horrible secondary characters, length for the sake of length, you know it. The Zhongli and Ajdaha storyline in this chapter is definitely its strongest part aside for the opening act. Although very similar in a way to Benti and Valin, it has more time to develop the ideas within it and the feelings Zhongli experiences to a better degree. Nothing to truly praise, but better nevertheless. Before I forget, this chapter of the story also has one of the worst fights in the game, the Liyue Harbor fight. At this point, the Albero clone and Scaramouche's first ever appearance had more impact and quality than both the prologue and first chapter for the main story. Truly outstanding writing. Also. Those two occurrences are, to this day, some of the best moments in the game. I wonder how Hoyoverse's writing team for Genshin Impact works. They may work by batches, as in they write a couple of nations and then a couple more, since so far that's how quality has been moving. Everything up to this point was quite honestly horrible. And no, a few good parts in a story will never excuse the downs of it. Then chapter 2 has a lot of improvements. Begs the question as to how they managed to make everything before it so exceptionally bad compared to the following content. Chapter 2 introduces us to a nation of Inazuma, quite honestly one of the most beautiful places in Genshin Impact even to this day. The structuring in this part of the story is, dare I say, worse than the previous two. Both parts before this were covered in filler content, but Inazuma shows how truly bad the writers are. When writers have no confidence in themselves, they let the audience dictate what decisions they make, and it seems like they lost almost all of their own will for Inazuma. Most of this chapter is filled with insignificant characters, empty moments, meaningless diversions, and straight up bad writing. And in perfect Genshin fashion, they manage to show how good the writers can be as well. This chapter also has Tepe, a secondary character who is pretty good. Inazuma is the first instance of good writing in the game. If you took all of the filler out of this quest and left only the truly important parts, it'd be a thousand times better. Maybe they wanted player retention, maybe the fans wanted longer stories and that's the only thing they could do, maybe they were just bad writers. Who knows what the real reason may have been, but the end result remains. A well-written chapter dirtied by horrible decisions and a ton of boring meaningless text. I know Genshin fans love defending their beloved game as it is more valuable to them than their own lives, but you can truly really love something without acknowledging its downsides and how bad it is or has been at certain points. Inazuma's good parts could be godly, but all of the unnecessary additions to it hinder its quality and take it from what could have been a good piece into a really bad one. Here I want to explain something to those of you who don't know this. Lore and story are two completely different things. I've seen people argue that a bad story is good even if it has good lore behind it. It isn't. The best example is real life. Our history as humans is fascinating, and yet majority of people don't really know too much about it because schools teach history like shit. A fictional story is no different. You can have a 10 out of 10 lore and a 3 out of 10 writing, and it's going to be a shit piece of literature. Genshin has always had a long, well thought out lore behind it, but its writers seem to go from good to horrible and vice versa for no reason at all. Rest in peace Inazuma, you could have been so beautiful, and yet you died before emerging from your chrysalis becoming no more than an empty husk covered in beautiful petals. And also thank you, you gave us amazing characters and won, if not, the best boss fight to this day in the form of A and her domain expansion. In Kanomiya is more of the same, amazing lore but too much unnecessary stuff. In my opinion, the story behind In Kanomiya is one of the greatest moments in Genshin. It reveals so much and makes the player ask more questions. And since it was a very self-contained section of the story, its filler didn't feel as obtrusive as in Asuma's, which was a multi-part main story quest. The Chasm once again shows the same problems and qualities, good story with a link that if cut in half would be so much better. Chapter 3 is Sumeru, and it is pretty similar to Inazuma, beautiful yet its beauty is covered in mud and you can barely see it, though this time it is more visible. The writing keeps improving as time goes by, as it should. The first section I believe is the weakest here. Too long, not that interesting, could have been handled way better. Sumeru's story gets better as it moves forward, unlike Inazuma which had bursts of quality every now and then. Once Nahira starts playing her role, the gears of the story truly start moving. There's also the loop section, which fits perfectly with the themes and myths, but once again, why do you make me go through so much of the same for no reason at all? I can see the argument as to how and why it had to be like that, but no. This is where writers had to show their skills. You have this particular section which is required in the story, but is also extremely tedious and boring, so how do you fix it? Answering this type of questions with the right answer is the mark of a good writer, and in this instance, they once again showed how bad they are. Then Nilo dances and holy are they good with visuals and music, but that comes later in the video. The Irminsul tree, 
Nahida is feeling abilities and personality, how people in Sumeru view their Archon's differences between Nahida and Ruka Devata. It becomes so interesting and intriguing as it keeps building upon itself. If only they made more use of the main characters, or make better secondary characters. Though I'll also praise someone like Jed who was an amazing and outstanding secondary character. Sumeru has less bad and more good, however the bad is still in plain sight and I can't ignore that. I praise it but I also didn't really enjoy it as I was going through it. The desert is a downgrade in the story again, the pacing for it was not as good as the section before it, still better than Mondstadt though. The ending for Sumeru's story has us facing Scaramouche, one of the best antagonists so far. With Mondstadt and Li Yue lacking a true antagonist and Inazuma having right an A, Scaramouche only really had one competitor for the best antagonist, and he honors his hype. With a sad tone behind him, Scaramouche isn't truly evil, he's just at the end of his strength leading him down a path of opposing those who remain true to themselves. Nahida and the Traveler face him and for the second time ever, a character dies. His and La Signora's deaths are amazing and the writers should definitely lose the fear of killing a character to keep players happy. If you give a character a good death, people will still spend money on them. The final scene between Ahida and Il Dottore is one of the best scenes in the entire game. It shows a unique side to a unique Archon as well as a little from one of the Fatui Harbingers, a scene that once again raises interesting questions and makes you want to know more, not only about the world, but also the characters who seem to be more than they show. By the end of Sumeru, you are one of two people. Those who don't care about quality and go through the story just because it's Genshin Impact and can hate something they love, or those who realize how a superb story is told like shit and makes it into a horrible one. Mostly bad side characters, lengthy stories for the sake of length, wasted main characters, a plain AMC that has no development at all aside from I couldn't fight a slime, now I fight Scaramouche, etc etc. If you've realized this, you are like me and ended up tired of Hoyu vs shit and maybe even quit by this point. I have always seen the potential behind Genshin and so I waited to make this video because I wanted to play Fontaine and have a better developed opinion. I'll speak about Fontaine at the last section of the video, since for it to make sense, first we need to discuss a few more things. The developers have already mentioned how they want to make a casual game, one that won't stress its players out and don't require too much from them. Since the beginning of the game we've had events, horrible, terrible, shitty events. Once again I mentioned the Scaramouche introduction, which happened during an old man, it was amazing and set some stakes and probably the most important question about the reality of the world of the bat. Every event in Genshin Impact is one of a few. A fighting event where you get special buffs and everything dies in about 0.01 millions of a millisecond and requires no skill at all. A quote unquote exploration event where they tell you where to go because true exploration will cause the players to have an aneurysm from the sheer stress they'd experience. Double drops which are limited. Of course, run and jump around for primal gems, take photos or collect stuff for primal gems. Summer waste of your time with long boring text with no skip button because that'd be too difficult to implement in the game. The one and only real challenging event in Genshin's history, which I only remember happening once, Mario Party minigames, hide and seek, lantern and right again, and who could forget, DC get hoy over someone who can make a decent event for once. Oh, almost forgot, the equivalent of a Honkai Star Roll update in the form of an anniversary. I know you're writing why the anniversary is actually good or how you don't play the game to get free stuff but to play, stop the tap Genshin fan, they give you a spin in the mouth and peace to the eyes as anniversary rewards, plus the equivalent of snorting rock up season in the form of an event that comes with this whole shit fest. For god's sake, I once saw a comment where a guy said how he'd never gotten gifts for his birthday and how that's somehow why an anniversary isn't special and shouldn't give players stuff, you Genshin addicts are a unique kind. Events in Genshin are a perfect example of the team behind it and their mediocre mentality. One time they mentioned how some events couldn't be made permanent because they weren't fleshed out enough, which means all events are shit and if we leave them in the game even the blinded players will notice how lazy we are at making their game. The game has no endgame at all. Once again, to you writing an angry comment right now, walking around the map, gathering 1 and 2 star relics and materials isn't content, that's a waste of time. The Spiral Beast is the only form of endgame content, however the difficulty in this activity is the simplest form of difficulty. Give mobs more HP, make the bosses have a 10 second damage window with 50 seconds of being underground and having resistance against everything, and make a floor where you are frozen 99% of the time. Once again, your heart rate starts increasing and thoughts are flooding your mind about how I'm wrong and you are right. These things don't make the abyss difficult, they make it annoying. My favorite gacha game is Fate Grand Order, and they mastered the difficulty 
difficulty in the form of what they call exhibition quests. These quests come once a year and are the best gameplay that game has to offer. Because the difficulty is based on special mechanics for each quest, instead of HP is difficulty, you get to use different themes, different characters, different skills. You have to think. You can't just do the same thing every single time. And once again, no, fire melts ice and ice freezes water is not the same. That is not a strategy. These quests in FGO are a one year only thing, but they are amazing content for players who want to test their skills. Genshin can't even try to do something like this, because little Timmy over there who thinks Eula is real and loves him would send death threats to people because he can't beat the quest with his level 90, 2% crit rate, 900% crit damage Eula. I've talked about the filler already, so I'll be brief. They want player retention and they know the only way to do this is to make the Archon quests be filled with unnecessary stuff. Why do I have to talk to some fucking grandma on fuck knows where at the farthest corner of Inazuma so that I can later go and fight a literal god inside of her fucking Ryoiki Tenka Yujutsu fucking Eternity Obsessed Purple Bitch just so that her pink fox friend comes and saves my ass by offering to give me that 500 year old walk walk slimy sloppy squishy blowy yoey motivating MC to beat her friend to the ground and telling her to go to the kitchen and make him a fucking sandwich to later find out that she failed at making it and accidentally created a fucking robot that wants to destroy the world because he has fucking mommy issues. Teapot. If you spend hours inside of it building shit, you are the problem. Not really, I can see why someone would enjoy it and hey, you do you honestly. Enjoy making your house, you are probably the least problematic type of Genshin player. Secondary quests are shit. Hangouts are basically there to reinforce mentally ill people's fake relationships with a character and convince them to keep playing the game, as well as dissipate the idea that if said characters were real, they'd never consider him just talking to the type of person who thinks Nin Wang will step on them and make them feel good. Listen, you can like and love a character, and you can do this a lot. It's fine, but there's a point in which people take things too far. Just remember the Kokomi incident and you'll know what I mean. The companion missions or the quest where you get to know the characters better have some really nice moments. My personal favorite is when Ayaka dances. I get to see my wife perform her beautiful dance just for me. Did I mention how she's my wife? And did I mention how she dance? Just for me. This quest's quality I think depends highly on how much you like the specific characters. I'm not going to enjoy Lina's quest as much as I enjoyed Ayaka's, not because one is objectively better than the other, but because I simply like a character more than the other. I will not criticize this part of the game as good or bad, I will just say I am definitely not gonna play all of them for the sake of this very short section of the video. The developers will probably maintain this mediocre mentality they've had since the beginning, and the community will continue to lick their toes as they sing their praises even though they get nothing in return. I recommend that if you ever try this game out, you stay away from the community and simply enjoy your time until you either decide to stop playing or to continue on. And you better not criticize anything about it or you'll end up labeled as a troublemaker and drama lover just like our boy Tectone. Here we support CBT, can befriend texticles. Before moving to the next section, my favorite in the video, allow me to briefly speak about the anniversary. People defend it a lot, they say how you should be grateful they gave you something, how they play the game for the game and not to get free stuff, how the developers don't owe you anything because you are a free to play and haven't really supported the game. If you think like this, you are truly helpless and no matter what anyone could say, you'd just continue being the same. Free to play players offer no money, but they offer time. A will is going to spend $5,000 and get a character and their weapon without having to put hours into the game. A free to play is going to spend 50 hours going around the map, doing quests, events, hangouts, dailies, abyss, just to get one single character. Then both are going to spend time farming artifacts and whatever else. Point being that everyone who plays the game contributes to its success. The game is absurdly successful and Hoyoverse gives players 20 wishes for the anniversary? Some people argue they give more, but let's be honest. Gliders are nothing, pets are nothing, food is nothing, level of materials are nothing, Mora is nothing, and 10 of those 20 wishes they give players are blocked behind a horrible amount of text and a whole bunch of left click spamming. The only real gift they can offer is Primo Gems, for the sole reason that they cannot be obtained infinitely from playing. Gliders, one is enough, pets, one is enough, everything else you can get it by playing. But eventually there will be no more Primo Gem sources other than dailies and buying them, that's why they 
are the only gift they can offer and characters of course. This one time a guy told me in a comment that 30,000 mora from the surveys is amazing as an AR-60 because they need it for upgrading. You can see from this how badly Genshin lovers manage to convince themselves that the company who makes their game is doing something good for them. Genshin anniversaries will forever be shit and players will praise and thank them because well I don't know, I truly can't comprehend how people can be like that. If all players wanted more and they voiced it, they'd get more. But this is impossible with the people who worry more about how sad it is that Tignati has a different voice than the horrible stuff the BA did which led to them being fired. To end this section, I want to summarize it as both the developers and community do nothing to improve the game and give it what it needs, thus leading it down the wrong path. Genshin will only ever die by its own hand, and even then that will never happen, so you either accept it or go play Honkai Star Rail. I recommend Honkai Star Rail. It is amazing. Also, since I mentioned Honkai Star Rail, its last update had an extremely short quest, however, seeing the quality the writers for this game have in comparison to the Genshin team, I expect them to continue exploring the supposed abandoned plots in future parts of the story. The plots seen in the same show don't have to end with it, they were introduced and probably will be explored in the future. I'm not gonna say the story was perfect, since unlike the quality developed storyline had, the Luofu did have some out of nowhere occurrences. Personally, I don't think the pacing was as bad as people make it out to be, but there's also the fact that we didn't get to form deep relationships with the characters. Don't forget, Bellobolk had Pella, who appeared for like 2 seconds, just like Yu Kong. Here's the thing, the Star Rail story had an amazing beginning and a second storyline with a worse quality. Genshin had a bad beginning beginning, story-wise, and a bad follow-up. I will give the Honkai Star Rail team a chance, the same way I did Genshin and I do believe the following Star Rail story quests will be better. Also, the last update wasn't supposed to be a story update, but still had a super short story quest. They could have added it in the previous patch, didn't and ended up getting some people angry. I expect the next actual story focused patch to be up to the quality of Bellobog at least and longer doesn't mean good. Just look at the quality in what we've seen from Fontaine compared to the previous stuff in Genshin and you'll realize longer doesn't equal good. The proper length does, and that proper length is where difficulty lies. Stop asking for longer story quests. Please, let the writing team write and hopefully reach the proper length for whatever comes next, whether it is on the shorter or longer end. And in the future, I will make a video on Honkai Star Rail. If it becomes horrible, I will make it earlier. If it instead becomes amazing, I will also make the video earlier. Editor's note. Unity is fucking around and sadly Hoyoverse might find out. With Unity's new monetization plans, both Genshin and Star Rail, and many other games, might see their future quality diminish to varying degrees. For 5 seconds, let's forget our differences and agree that this is sad to think about. Editor's note. I forgot to add the Dainsleaf quests because 1. I forgot and 2. After remembering them, I simply didn't find anything worthwhile about them. They give the players more questions than answers, and who knows when those answers will get to us. Plus, they are also filled with boring stuff, the only interesting parts being at the end of set quests, when they give you a big reveal, but nothing else. I also want to say, maybe the bad writing wasn't the result of the writers being bad, but the incompetence of whoever is directing them. Well, this is one more editor's note. So, we got the Genshin livestream and we got to see the new anniversary rewards. Four fragile resin, one pet, one bubble generating thingy useless, and a staggering 20 wishes. Here's the thing, it keeps getting worse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, clearly Hoyobers just doesn't care about the Genshin players and once again, they are not gonna do anything. The players are just gonna be praising Hoyobers and being like, oh, you should be thankful for the 20 wishes because they are free. <laughs> yeah, uh, at this point, bro, come on, <laughs> come on. Oh god. Well, that is one more editor's note. I will hurry up so that I don't have to make a whole new section for the video. Also, I didn't notice this. But for the anniversary, there's also going to be a top-up bonus reset. So, not only do they give you shit in the actual anniversary stuff, no, they are also making it so that it's like, hey, but if you spend money, you get double. 
You see, you see, you see. So you, you might want to spend a little bit of that of that door. Here's the thing, all right? They use they 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 have no respect for the players. But let's be honest. How can we ask Hoyovers to have some respect for the Genshin community when not even they respect themselves? They, this is actually just. Uh, it's not even disappointing or horrible. It's just, it's just like. It's sad. That's what it is. It's sad. It's depressing. <laughs> In my opinion, video games are or can be the best form of art this world has seen to this day. Art comes in various shapes, colors, and sounds. It is, to its core, an expression of the human mind which cannot be expressed through conventional methods. We understand Van Gogh's pain through his paintings, yet he couldn't express it through words. We can feel Vivaldi's emotions throughout a symphony even if we have never spoken to him. We can see Da Vinci's desire for knowledge from his works and how he never truly focused on a single one of them. Even a warrior's exploits during a moment in history in which he burned his body and soul to protect the ideas he so dearly held. Art is beautiful because it resonates with those who observe it, and it is nothing without someone to witness it. Thus, video games are the best form of art. Why? Because they can take multiple other aspects of art and combine them into a chimera which swallows its witnesses whole. You stand before a painting and observe its beauty. In a game, you walk through it. You listen to a song and close your eyes as it envelops you in the imagery born from each note. In a game, it plays as you reach the highest peak in the world and makes the sunrise become the most beautiful sight you've ever seen, making that song bring the memory of the sweet days you spent exploring that beautiful world every time it plays. They make literature change your role from an observant to a player, making every stake, every feeling, every word, every action feel like your own instead of that of a character. Can you see what I mean? Remember, this is just my opinion and nothing else. I do genuinely believe that video games have the potential to be the best form of art, but I'm not gonna say a Call of Duty game is that, even though I believe something like Nier is. And even if I believe this, you may not. I'm just here to share my opinions and feelings about different things. I will always do my best to be unbiased when criticizing a piece of media, especially if I see it as art. This goes for both sides. If a piece is good, I'll praise it. If it is instead bad, I'll judge it. That's why I want to say this game is a horrible mess, it's boring, it lacks in way too many areas, but it is also one of the most beautiful pieces of art I have seen. Let me explain. First, Hoyovers didn't go for crazy realistic graphics, instead it chose the style route. None is better than the other of course, and they offer different tools to work with. Genshin Impact made me feel the same way Skyrim did a decade ago. The beauty of its world isn't shown to you at the beginning, it's only when you set out to explore that you come face to face with it. You walk around and see a mountain far away, questioning whether or not you can climb to its top. You walk towards it, reach its base, and start climbing. You keep going up as the wind and all other sounds of this beautiful world can be heard. Also, Lisa's moaning. And finally, once you are about to reach the peak, music starts playing, you stand at the very top, and you see this beautiful world from it. The music, combined with the image before you, causes you to just enjoy, to simply look at what is in front of you. Your character stretches and it becomes a part of that same image. You, the player, are standing in the middle of the painting born from your desire of simply climbing a mountain whilst being enchanted by the music playing. The battles can also be art. Kasu has ultimate combined with Ayaka in the middle of it as she charge attacks, Eula or Yelan's pose after attacking while standing in the middle of a forever frozen moment. Or Rosaria jumping and nailing her lance into the ground as fire embraces her surroundings. The game also has some of the best music in, to my opinion, all of history. Duvalin's theme, Kaelestion Finale, which could be translated as the end of heavens. Kailus meaning heaven or sky, and finale meaning the end or ending, fearing for a dragon who could bring chaos to the world below him. Andrews' theme, the symphony of boreal wind. Do you remember the first fight with him? Here his name wasn't Andrius, instead it was Boreas. When I first saw it, I instantly knew why they chosen that name. Boreas is, in Greek mythology, a god related to the northern winds, storms, and winter. The theme also has the word Boreal, which simply means of the north, fitting for the wolf who possesses both the blessing of the animal and cryo elements, forming the cold winds of the north.
The Inazuma OST is filled with amazing music. Simply stand in the city of Inazuma City and enjoy the notes that embellish this nation. No matter where you are, Inazuma is, at all times, bursting with beauty. Raiden's theme, Judgment of Euthymia. Euthymia in medicine relates to when people with bipolar disorder find themselves in a tranquil state, yet it is not the same as the calmness those without this mental disorder experience. In Greek, eu means well, and thymos, soul or emotion. Themos can also mean life energy, feelings and passions, desires and inclinations, and thought or intelligence. A is the ruler of Inazuma and pursues eternity, the never-changing state of being for her nation. Her existence is comprised of two sides, Raiden A, the Archon herself, and Raiden Shogun, the puppet she created. Two sides form her being, she pursues her desire with conviction, she has her own plane of euthymia, and she is, without a doubt, an intelligent individual. I guess you can see why her theme is called Judgment of Euthymia. Ah hey, you are one of the best characters in this game. During the first summer event, we have Fischl as a main figure, with her own domain and super interesting story. The event itself wasn't amazing, but at the time it was fresh and new. This event also brought my favorite song in Genshin Impact. The Midsummer Nacht Fantasy, meaning the Midsummer Night's Fantasy. Clearly inspired by Vivaldi's Four Seasons Summer. Makes sense since it is the summer event. It also makes me think of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, although that may be a little far-fetched. I can't really remember the details of this event's story to know whether or not it has similarities with the already mentioned piece of literature. I wouldn't be surprised if it does, and I would be happy. Go listen to this song, it is simply amazing. Dance of Sabserus. Sumeru is inspired by multiple cultures. As far as I can tell, it draws inspiration from India, Egypt, and Greece. The dance of Sabserus is the song that breaks the cycle of repetition Sumeru is entrapped in, the Samsara. In Hinduism, reincarnation is a central belief. A Samsara is the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, and this clearly inspired this quest in the game. This cycle is broken once Nilo follows what her heart desires. After beating all which stood in her way, the bravery of a single girl starts to draw the gaze of the people around the stage. And with her graceful dance, she takes people away from the samsara, now embracing them in an ephemeral moment where not even the gods shine as bright as her. What a beautiful moment. These are just a few of my favorite songs in Genshin, and even then all of my favorite are only some of all the songs in the game. Music is beautiful and it becomes even better when tied to something else. It could be a song important to you and your significant other, maybe a song which motivated you even at your lowest, or the first song you ever managed to play with your own hands. Music that is tied to a moment or feeling becomes even more enchanting. This is what I said before. Art enhances art, and games being able to perfectly combine multiple arts becomes the ultimate form of it. It doesn't mean that all games are art, it simply means that games as a form of art have more potential than others when utilized to its maximum. Editors update. Yu Peng Cheng is leaving MiHoYo. Fontaine's soundtrack had zero input from him, so I'm sure the game's music will still be amazing in the future. Yu Peng Cheng is, in my opinion, one of the best composers we've seen in the past 100 years. He not only draws inspiration from classical composers, but also incorporates traditional instruments in his music. Listen to any song he made for Genshin and you'll notice how good he is. I am of the thought that video games make classical music have a place in the modern era. There is this guy on YouTube, Marco Meatball is his channel, who shares this opinion. He's become my go-to channel for music analysis and I encourage you to go and watch his videos. My favorite is the D Midsummer Night Fantasy one since that's the one that made me subscribe to him. Either way, Yu Peng Cheng is now going to move on to new stuff. With how amazing he is, I expect to listen to more of his brilliance in the future. Artists often find it really hard to do their own stuff since there is always a feeling of doubt no matter how small, so he has my respect for adventuring in such an obscure and exciting path for his art. I will support his music, and if I were to ever have my own game or movie or whatever, I'd want him as a composer for it. Thank you for giving us such amazing pieces. I wish you the best for your career, your music, and you as an artist. And as far as I am concerned, I will forever love the music you gifted to us in Genshin Impact. Finally, let's talk characters. I love them. The character design, purely visual, is some of the best out there. Every single character has a personality and their outfits match their persona, and they also hide their history. Yelan, for example, has only one bracelet and a jacket that stands out from her outfit. These two pieces tell the tale of how a Fatui Harbinger, 
pantalones, stole her other bracelet, and in return, she stole the jacket he intended to give to the Tsaritsa and modified it into her own. Characters also each possess a constellation. Some examples? Monas is Astrolabos. Beidos is Victor Mare. Kasuhas is Acer Palmatum. And Nahiras is Sapientia Oromasdis. Astrolabos. Astro, referring to the stars or celestial bodies in general, and Labos, referring to work, a task, or a struggle. Astrolabos belongs to the astrologist, whose task is to uncover the truth of the world after hearing about its fake sky, no matter the struggle. Victor Mare, the victor of the sea, belonging to the fearless captain of the crooks, Beido. Acer Palmatum. Acer, the Latin name for maple tree and also meaning sharp. Palmatum describes a leaf that is shaped like a hand. So, Acer Palmatum, meaning a maple with a leaf shaped like a hand. Fitting for Kasuha, the maple being related to him and longing for his friend whose hand he will never again hold. Now moving forward with his sharp blade and senses. Sapientia Oromasdis, Sapientia for wisdom. Ahura Mazda in Zoroastrianism, an Iranian religion, is the creator deity and god of the sky. Ahura for lord and Mazda for wisdom. Also known as Oromazdes, Oromazdes is simply a Latin transliteration of the aforementioned god's name. Nahida Lesser Lord Kusanali, the god of wisdom and Dendro Archon possessing of the constellation Sapientia Oromazdes. Not only the constellations, but Archons also possess names originated from demons. Venti as Barbatos, a demon who can speak to animals, possesses knowledge of the past, present and future, conciliates friends and rulers, and leads men to hidden treasure. John Lee as Morax, president of hell and teacher of astronomy and liberal sciences. Raiden A as Belzebub, former angel under the archangel Gabriel, now third in command of hell right under Lucifer and Satan. Nahida as Buer, the great president of hell, teacher of natural and moral philosophy and logic, as well as the qualities and uses of all herbs and plants, also possessing the ability to heal all infirmities, especially those of humans. Furina as Focalor. He drowns men and commands the wind and the sea. Characters are extremely interesting and yet Hoyovers makes us talk to some old lady or random NPCs for whatever fucking reason instead of taking advantage of the amazing tools available to them. Please use them. As you can probably see by this point, Genshin Impact is heavily inspired not only by myths, but also demonology, religions, and real life cultures. They even utilize multiple languages when naming stuff. They use so much from so many different sources whilst also making sense of it. Constellations are all related to the owner of each, and Archons are named after demons who are in some ways similar to them. Don't forget the music, also containing not only meaning through the song itself, but the title of the piece as well. Everything works so well together, and it would be even more amazing if the writing was up to the quality of some other parts of the game. The more knowledge you possess, the better art becomes. And once again, art inspires art as seen in how many different pieces have served as inspiration for the game you love and I hate. Please let this section inspire you into doing some research about your favorite characters and their multiple layers of design. I myself already knew a lot about these details and even then managed to learn new stuff. Good job Genshin, if only you could utilize your own myths with the dexterity you use others. And if you ever want to play Genshin Impact, I recommend you don't. For every good thing about it, there is a hundred bad. I can't tell someone to punish themselves into playing just to reach something amazing after every 8 hours filled with horrible content. But if you want to, hey, now you know a little about how bad and good this game can be. I was originally going to make this video a couple of months earlier, instead I waited, since I, stupidly enough, have hopes in Genshin. Some people hate it and have abandoned it, some love it and refuse to criticize it. I do my best to do both. I hate the bad and love the good. Sadly, there is an abundance of bad, thus I hate it more than I love it. I also want to let everybody know that no matter how good Fontaine is, there won't be a super big update until the next region. Fontaine will become bigger and all of that, but the slow content drip shows how mediocre the game is once again. We could definitely get a new region every 6 months, but it will never be like that. Instead, it will be another year full of boring repetitive events, 
no combat focused stuff at all, and of course no end game because poor little Genshin players are going to get anxiety if they need to do something other than collect trash for 2 hours on their freshly new Fontaine farming route. And these are not just my own words, the devs themselves said how they don't want to stress players out, otherwise they might get dead threats and harassed by them. Still, I'll give Hoyobres the opinion they got from me here. Let this last section be a mark of what I feel towards Genshin, both as a game and a piece of art. This is Fontaine. The good is, as always, good. The world design is outstanding, the music is absolutely perfect, with the underwater versions and transitions being superb. The characters are the best they have ever been and that is saying a lot. The artistic side of the game is somehow better than ever before, in my opinion at least. And for the first time ever, I finished the Archon Quest being satisfied and glad that I played through it. Let's start with the beginning, Urina. Soldiers lining up, her champion making way for her lady. Accompanied by a beautiful song, she proudly presents herself to you and her people. Stand proud, for you are in presence of the Mistress of Fontaine and Hydro Archon, Lady Furina. She confidently challenges the Traveler to a duel, and without a second thought, the Traveler prepares themselves to engage in battle. Furina certainly didn't expect that. The best opening scene for an act in this play called Genshin Impact, setting up not only her personality, but also the pride she carries with herself. She may not be the most powerful, nor the most intelligent, but I guarantee you, no one shines as bright as she does. Absolutely magnificent. As far as introductions go, Ventis was shit, Zhongli was meh, Raiden was amazing, and Nahida was sad. Furina is plain fucking good. Allow me to explain. Just like her soldiers, the notes in the song line up making way for the queen. She enters the scene and in a moment of solitude and pride, she now stands atop the people. She knows who she is and she is proud of it. Confident and full of conviction, she faces the famed traveler yet she hides her own feelings behind the mask of a queen. You get challenged to a duel in court, which will later occur due to completely different reasons. Linnae's and Lynette's act is as amazing as can be. We all knew something would go away, so they handled the pacing to the best of their ability. Just when you thought shit will go down, it doesn't. You stop expecting it, and then boom, it happens. It's not going to be a huge surprise, simply because of course it was gonna happen, yet it managed to be as unexpected as possible. The handling of Lina's trial was perfect. Purina is always amazing, Nebile evokes respect, Lina was a multi-layered character, Navia was lovely, and the MC, us, was so much fun to play as. I personally kinda got the answer, but not really. <laughs> It was on the shorter end, yet it wasted no time and also didn't overextend any of it. The gameplay side of it never becomes tiring since it's short and the dialogue all serves a purpose. Characters have a charming personality each, the subtext is good, it's fun and exciting and it manages to keep you wanting for more. To fully know how good it is, go play it. Or if you don't play Genshin Impact and don't wanna go through so much shit just so that you can get to Fontaine, you can also watch my stream bots and enjoy it there. Linnae and Lynette being Fatui was revealed in perfect fashion, and the reasons for it are not as black and white. Navia's plot with her father and the traitor once again were handled flawlessly. This time I also kinda got the answer, but not really. You initially don't offer to help Navia. Perfect. DMC has no reason to help and they are worried about more pressing matters. Then you get attacked, she saves you and you decide to help her. It's simple and kind of convenient, but it serves its purpose and makes sense. You decide to help her and embark on this new adventure. Well portrayed feelings, well built mystery, a well formed quest, and outstanding characters. The quest has the perfect length again, with amazing secondary characters each serving their purpose to a D. Another court, this time with Tartaglia also in it. You save him and help Navia get closure as well, whilst also ending the pain the perpetrator caused to others and his own. Questions are asked here and left without answers, for they shall arrive later. The legend of the future of Fontaine becomes more than just that and threatens the world. And finally, Tartaglia is set free. What? The oratrice judged Tartaglia as guilty? What the fuck? Fontaine's first two chapters are extremely short, 
but they are a million times better than anything before them. It's hard comparing writing since there are too many differences, Inazuma had tools that Sumeru didn't and Sumeru had tools that Fontaine could never have. A piece of literature has its own tools to work with, this is why writing isn't really something that can be taught. Maybe the pacing, maybe the plot, perhaps the structure, or even the characters. Literature is comprised of multiple layers the writers must figure out how to unite and make sense of them, and the Genshin writing team always has a plethora of tools to work with, yet they use them like shit or straight up don't use them. The tools offered by previous Archon chapters were either wasted or tainted by use of random useless stuff. Fontaine and the 4th Archon chapter handle its tools without a fault. Let me be perfectly clear. Nothing will ever be perfect, but the downsides on this chapter are so minor that they simply don't matter. Every year within this story was placed with love and care, making it move fluently and gracefully. It surprises me that whoever wrote this chapter also wrote the ones before. Maybe they hired someone else, and if they didn't, whether it was a whole team or a single person, you improved like fucking crazy. You have my praise and my thanks. Few things I love more than art. In fact, I don't like anything more than art. I kept the hopes I initially had placed on this game and no matter how much I hated it, I stuck through it just to see how beautiful it could be when all of the tiny strings forming it were weaved together with real love. Once again, this chapter was perfect for at least the first two acts. I ask you to keep this quality and make the rest of the game as good as what we've seen from Fontaine. And if you can make it even better, then fuck it, go ahead and make me fall in love. Oh man, I love video games so much. Genshin as a whole is a horribly unsightly mess, with so much beauty obscured by the mud the developers pour onto it. Video games are art, and Fontaine shows how bright this piece called Genshin Impact can shine when treated with the love and respect it deserves. I don't expect either the community or developers to change, but please, to the writing team working on Genshin. Keep this quality, you are better than you could ever imagine. Don't let anyone stop you from reaching the heights of your abilities as writers. Editor's update. I took too long to make this video and there is a new update, which means more story. First let me apologize for the lack of good visuals, even if this is a video most people would only listen to, I'd still like the visuals to be a bit better, but my PC sadly can handle it and even just moving an audio from one place to another takes a couple seconds, so adding more would have been too difficult and maybe even end up making it impossible to finish. Anyways, the story. Majority of this new section takes place in the prison. The visuals are nothing to praise, it's a prison, that's it. Music is good, character design, holy shit, Risley is now my number one when it comes to male character designs and he's also fucking cool. The story itself starts to get tiring during the beginning of the quest when you are just doing detective work in the prison, but as soon as it starts to drag out, it picks up the pace again and regains the quality. I think the writing was again never wasted, secondary characters were that, simply secondary characters, and the use of the main characters was incredible. I personally loved seeing the Linne, Lynette and Fremine trio as it was really cute. Every main character in the prison was interesting, cool and fun, and of course their visual designs are fucking amazing. The prison itself, its history, how it works, and its rules all work perfectly together and add some originality to it as it wasn't simply a normal prison. The ending of this part of the Fontaine story quest was Chef's Kiss. I had the guess that Nebile was either the Archon or the Dragon during the last patch and he is indeed the Dragon and also so fucking cool. Questions were answered and more were asked, the mysteries presented are super intriguing and the cinematics were incredible. They also used art during dialogue instead of just the characters being there, really nice, do it more. And finally Arlequino. She was as good as I would have liked her to be, go play or watch my bots and you'll know what I mean. Her and Furina's back and forth was amazing, seeing Furina worried the entire time showed more about her personality and the things Arlequino did to her showed Furina's weakness even more. I also considered the possibility of Furina not being the Archon, but who knows, maybe she's a young Archon, maybe the previous Archon somehow cursed her, or maybe she really isn't the real Archon. Either way, Arlequino was incredible and she made Furina show more about her true self. I also look forward to seeing not only both of them, but more of all the Fontaine main characters. This update had a story section as good as the last in different ways, but still just as good. Again, Genshin, you have my praise. Genshin's story and world is built upon incredibly amazing ideas. Seeing how Hojiverse doesn't really wanna give players any good gameplay or events, I will be satisfied with Genshin as long as I get a well-written story, so that's all I'm asking from it. I just hope we get to see more beautiful stuff just like we've already had so many times. This game may be covered in shit, but whenever its beauty is visible, it is some of the most astonishing sights you will ever see.
Being halfway through the game, I can confidently say what a waste of potential Genshin Impact is. And also, such beauty is simply, well, lovely. This has been Genshin Impact, an expression of mediocrity and lingering hope.